Welcome back, everybody, to the Millennial Dentist Podcast. We are, Pam and I are here at his office, Friday morning, a uh, beautiful day in July, mm-hmm. and we are super pumped to have a, a super special guest, one that both Pam and I have looked up to for a while um, after spending tons of time in, on Dental Town in school, uh, but Howard Ferran himself. Yes. Welcome, Doc. Oh, man, Good it's night. a huge honor to be on your show. I, I, uh, it's so damn cool to watch <laughs> yeah, you guys. Yeah. We appreciate it, though. Yeah, we, we appreciate it. Honestly, <laughs> this is extreme. I mean, last month, when Ryan, um, me and Ryan talked, I'm like, man, can we get him? And I've been very blessed and excited to do this, man. been waiting for this. The what's honor, good with you? Uh, what's new with me? Um, gosh, you know, I mean, I, I just celebrated my 30-year anniversary in my dental office, and you just opened yours up, so you're like my kids. Um, <laughs> you know, just having, uh, just having grandbabies, that's the new thing with me. You just got another one. So, you know, that's just, uh, you know, when you're 54, the, the neatest thing in the world is grandchildren. So do uh, you guys have kids? <laughs> No kids. No kids. No kids. So you guys are, are uh, dental millennial geniuses. <laughs> we're trying to be. We're trying to. We're trying to change the perspective a little bit. I feel like millennials are getting a bad rap a little bit. So we're trying to uh, show the positives of what our generation is bringing to the table. Well, you, you know, you when you get to my age, you don't figure out what's right and wrong. You just start recognizing patterns. And every generation, going back to recorded literature, thinks the next generation is going to screw up. But then you sure. look at every hundred years it goes by, the civilization just gets better and better and better. So this is a pattern. It's, it's kind of like if you go into religion, like 20% think the end of the world is coming. So you, right. you leave that. You say, well, is it or is it not? Well, you go into Wall Street. 20% think the stock market is going to crash any day. I mean, you go into dentistry. 20% think when I got out of school 30 years ago, it was uh, capitation was going to ruin dentistry. Then it was OSHA. And then it was HIPAA. Now it's corporate dentistry. And then you realize after 30 years, hey, look, nobody can keep all their patients in dentistry. So well, why, why is anybody else going to do it? I mean, you go to any dental office with 5,000 charts, 4,000 of them never came back. So you, you really think Aspen Dental and Heartland is your problem? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're exactly right. And most people aren't tracking that, so they're, they have no idea what's actually happening when they, when they look at it. Hey, a couple things. So I guess the first thing I really wanted to get your opinion on, talk to you about, and then there's a couple of things I want to hit on. But, you know, priority one is, like you said, you just, you're just you celebrating your 30th anniversary, payment six months in, um, or we're both basically two years out of school, three years out of school. If, if you had to give your, you know, your nuggets of wisdom to the graduating dentist, the new dentist, I mean, you've seen it all. You've been through those, those generational changes, the changes in industry. You know, what are you telling new graduates? What is your advice? I mean, that's the big thing I want to hear is kind of just talk about a lot of that stuff. All right. Feel free to interrupt me. I mean, I don't want, I don't want to rant. Oh, we will. Don't worry. I don't want you guys <laughs> have to, like, get up and go get a beer just to, 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 to wait and fry it. Listen <laughs> well, to the old man Fran talk about that. <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's the same pattern. Like, let's switch from dentistry to a real estate agent. You know, you get this car and they got all this alphabet soup behind their name. You don't know what any of that crap means. Then you go – Talk to your 401k guy, and he's got all this alphabet soup behind your name. Nobody knows what any of that alphabet soup – No, they don't even know the difference between a DMD and a DDS, let alone an MAGD, oh. all that diplomat crap. What you need the most is the, the, the chairside manner. What you need the most is to be able to connect with humans. Now, the research is showing that um, you only got like 15, 20, 30 seconds to make this happen, and the dentists that crush it – they have that skill with their staff. They're able to attract and retain quality key staff. Like, talk about practice management. I mean, there are a dozen amazing practice management consultants, but you don't even have to learn any of that if you hired an office manager who already knows all that. If you can attract and retain, I mean, some dentists get to work and, you know, they're, they're control freaks. They, 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 they don't understand um, um, leadership. They'll, they'll walk in their office. They'll, they'll walk up to the front desk. And the first thing they'll say is, why do I have an opening from two to three? And she's sitting there looking at you like, you're a monster. Like, good morning to you. You're an idiot. <laughs> That's so and, true. And, and, and you, know, um, you know, having the soft stuff is the only thing that matters. You sell the invisible. You know, it, when I go buy an iPhone, I mean, shit, I could, you could buy it from an ATM machine. I mean, it's an iPhone. It's a standardized product. When you go buy a Coca-Cola, you actually do get it out of a machine. Um, bottled water it's just a bottle of water. But when I come up to you and you say, well, I know you came in here for a $20 oil change, but I really need to change your transmission fluid and your air filter pump. Well, in about five seconds, I'm going to look at you and think, okay, are you, are you, are you selling me for money or do I believe you? Um, you, your, Your air conditioner goes out. So some man shows up 
And he says, you know what? Your air conditioner's old. You need a $9,000 new air conditioner. And in about five seconds, I'm just looking at you thinking, do you just want $9,000? Do I really? You're selling the invisible. They, when you tell them that they have four cavities and that they're $250 each, they're thinking, okay, do you do you just want a grand? I mean, a thousand bucks? I mean, are you trying to go to Disneyland? I mean, you know. So, <laughs> so to get that, it's all the soft stuff. So the, the dentist who understands people and makes a conscious effort. Now, some people, some dentists are just born monsters. They're dicks. They're not nice guys. But they turn <laughs> Hollywood when they go to the dental office. I mean, look, look, look at these um, look at these actors. Um, you know, they'll, they'll tell some actor, okay, now we're going to do a movie and you're going to be Gandhi. Well, they're just like, okay, I'll become Gandhi. And then the whole movie, they're Gandhi. When, when you walk in that door, you go from your car to on stage with your staff and your patients. And the people that just know how to press the flesh, run for mayor, have the right look, make people likable in five or 10 seconds. So you go and do a hygiene check. I mean, some people go down and they sit down. The first thing they do is start looking at the x-rays. It's like, well, good morning to you. You know, yeah. I, you know <laughs> am I just a set of teeth in a chair or am I a human? But then there's that other dentist who walks in there and just makes eye contact and grabs her hand. I mean, I mean, I feel like, I mean, like I'm in Phoenix where there's a gazillion 80 year old ladies that retire down here that aren't going to live in the snow in North and South. 10% of this town is from Canada. My God, what is the <laughs> only thing a 70, 80, 90, 100 year old woman wants when she goes to the dental office? A big old bear hug from Dr. Ferran. Hell, Some I loving, yeah. I, I only kiss them on the forehead if they're like in their 60s, but my 70, 80, 90, 100, it's on the mouth. They freaking <laughs> love it. I give them a big old hug. I tell them they look great. I ask them what's going on. And you establish that likability and trust. I've had my dental assistant for 30 years. There's about a thousand, there are probably a, several hundred old men that only come to my office because Jan always gives them a big hug. I mean, that you know, it's that's yeah. the skill set that makes you successful. And if you got that down and you do really shitty dentistry, you'll still have a million dollar practice. And if you went to all the alphabet soup stuff, you went to every institute, Panky, Sphere, Dawson, Kois, or the whatever, and have all this diplomat crap behind your names, and you don't connect with your staff and your patients, you're always, always behind the eight ball. So that's my first point. So let me let me stop you there because I'm gonna recap that because that that those are huge. So basically, the first point being, you know, relationship with team, being able to connect with them and and not be a dick, basically. And then the other is is how do you is you know communicate communicating with patients. Yeah. And and what's funny is I feel like most graduates we graduate and we're like, oh, well, we need to go figure out how to do this, do that. And I would say I'd be willing to bet that you know, knowing the type of people that end up in dental school and and our colleagues that probably less than 70 percent of them at least half of them suck at that and you know and they're and then when they're and no one's getting ce in that you know no one's trying to learn how to be a better communicator or 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 try to how do i work with patients or or you know and i love I and mean, frankly the word sell dentistry right like if we don't create value for what we do then ultimately it's it, it falls on dead ears and we are just uh you know the car salesman trying to get them to change their transmission fluid or, or whatever that is so I, I love those two points because that, that I think is probably some of the, the biggest reason we've been successful is not our ability to, I mean, yeah, we've had really good mentors and we've learned a lot of good skills, but we're, we're both, we could both talk to a brick wall and we're, we're pretty good at creating that value, but the majority of people graduating aren't. And then we don't want to go learn how to do it. Well, like sense? when I get my oil changed, do I really care if the kid is 25 years old and six months out of auto mechanic school or 55 no. or 65? I assume you work here. I assume you know how to change my oil. I assume you know how to fix my filling. You think into it because you know all the little details that Carl Misch can place an implant better than your dad and your dad can place one better than you. But the consumer doesn't ever think things like that. And, and the deans are accepting everybody with the wrong skill sets. Like, how do you get into dental school? Well, you got to get A's in calculus, physics, geometry, and chem. Well, who are those people? The idiot nerd sitting in the library every night who never right. joined a frat or never had a date, or I mean, every single night at Creighton, I heard the same thing. Ding. The library will be closing in 10 minutes. And then I'd walk back from the library to Swanson <laughs> Hall dorm, and all the business majors are drinking beer. They're sneaking in girls into an all-boys 
Jesuit dorm, and and I I thought they were like vile and disgusting. I thought like, we're we're here to learn, and and you're making abuse. <laughs> oh of this. yeah. And then One they the do thing the wrong I'll, demographics. I'll let you mention that. Go ahead. I'll tell after this um, about the same thing about in dental school. I feel the one thing that I always complained um, was like, why didn't we have business classes? Why didn't they really teach us management of how you manage your money and business? But then when I got out or when th going through a school and then getting out, I realized really business is not what we needed back in school as much as we needed communication with the patient. Like what you just mentioned today is so much more valuable to me and a lot of the kids in school. Now, I don't, I'm blessed enough. And I think genetically that plays a big role too, Howard, as far as how you be, become likable, how you make that persona and that the patients like you because of your, not only their doctor, but they can call you their friends when they're out of town or uh, anything like that. So that whole communication thing, I feel like that could be more emphasis in schools also, what's your input on that versus well, did, the did business? Your, did your school. schools teach you your religious beliefs? Did the school teach you your cultural, your music beliefs, your your um, dietary habits? I mean, I mean, dentistry is, is it's a craft. It's a hands work with your hands, welding. Mechanic. It's all surgery. Um, you you wanted to be a surgeon. They taught you how to be a surgeon. Then you walk out of school and say, well, hey, you didn't teach me whether I should have voted for Trump or Hillary or be atheist, agnostic or Jewish or, you know, I mean, the, the schools just do their craft and there's no one in that school that ever ran a business. I mean, those who do, do, and those who can't teach. So I don't think there's anybody even in the school that could teach it. Um, and, and the schools, not only are they accepting the wrong skill sets of a, of a personal yeah. person, since we sell the invisible and it's a trust-based society. I mean, when I check into a hotel, why did the maid put that wrap around the toilet seat? Because she's selling the invisible. I didn't see her clean the toilet. She's trying to tell me. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. She's saying, <laughs> I clean the toilet. When you, when you order a, a, um, a drink, uh, you know, uh, or you order room service, you know, I'm a health food fanatic. I believe that you have to have cranberry juice. just heals all your organs. So every night before I go to bed, I always want a double gray goose with a splash of cranberry juice in there just for health purposes. <laughs> Seems perfect. And, nice. uh, and they still leave a piece of the straw on. Because the bartender's saying, we're a class act. I mean, we're selling the invisible. And dentistry is all invisible. Nobody knows if they have a cavity or not. Nobody knows if what you say is true. And, and, um, and then the other thing that dental schools do wrong is they do the wrong demographics. Like, they thought that if they swelled the classes from 4,000 to 6,000, it would push you guys all out into the rural. And that's why everybody thought the best idea for availability and accessibility when you look at the Midwest where 11% of these towns don't have one single dentist. But now what they know for a fact is who's the only person who will live in a town of 5,000? A boy born in a town of 5,000. So yep. if you want dentists to go rural, then stop accepting them from Memphis and Nashville and Chattanooga and start accepting them only from towns under 5,000 and they'll go back there. And so, um, oh, so point. yeah, so the skill sets uh, uh, are are not met. One of the big things I, I learned very quickly on, and we see it all the time. I'm sure you see it. Is we'll get, is when we graduate, when we go to dental school, we're taught to make these just giant treatment plans from start to finish and diagnose everything we see, every little thing, and then we like print that out. We give that to the patient and we say, here's your treatment. We're gonna start here and go. And it's like this big, you know, in dental school, that may not be that big of a number just because, well, dental school's prices are cheaper. Now, you do that in, in, you know, with a new patient that comes in who's been to a bunch of other dentists and doesn't have, you know, has had some dental work, but, you know, hasn't, doesn't have done it, and you give them a $15,000 treatment plan, then they're freaking gone. You know, like, they're running out the door, they're going to the next dentist to get a second opinion who's going to do something less than you did, obviously, and then they're never coming back to you. So, you know, that was a big thing for me was trying to learn how to treatment plan a little differently, not to not tell patients what they need, um, but just not to overwhelm patients out of the gate, like kind of the mindset we were taught in dental school. Well, what are you driving right now? What car are you driving? How old is it? What did it cost you? An 06 Toyota Tundra. Uh, it was like 12 grand. So you're driving a $12,000 car that's uh, basically 11 years old. Yes. All right. And Pay Ray, what are you driving? Uh, Nissan Altima 2010 with 80,000 miles on it. I bought it brand new for dental school, and I've been driving it since I graduated. But what, what, what did it cost? What, what did you uh, pay it for? cost 20, right? I mean, it's been paid off by 24,000 when I bought it. Okay, so here, here's the point. 
So the average price of a new car in America right now is about 30,000 bucks, okay? It's actually like 33,000. Well, let's just say 30,000 bucks. I'm going to ask you guys, what percent of Americans in their lifetime will buy an average new car? A lot. What percent? 50%. 60, okay. 75%. Okay, so you say 50 to 75%. What percent of dentists have never ever sold a single treatment plan for that price of a new car, 30,000. 90%. Yeah. So so the consumer has shown you, yeah, we dropped $30,000. Hell, what what is an F150 decked out truck cost these days out in the 50, rural areas? 50, 60,000 some of those. Oh, absolutely. And these people have no problem doing 50, 60. So it's the treatment plan presentation where some people, you know, it, it like, okay, I'll give you an example. I've got money. I got a 2005 Lexus with like 150,000 miles. Well, I only live 3.0 3 miles from my dental office and 3.5 miles from dental town. And so I figured <laughs> the worst case, so, so every time I take it in for an oil change, the, you know, um, every time I take it in for an oil change, they say, well, if you give us your car and give me a check for $95,000, i will give you a new one. Now, they didn't say, you have to buy a new car, and I never came back. They just showed me what's going on, and I'm like, well, you know, I just don't want to give you 95000 to upgrade a Lexus that it's never farted since 2005, and I'm only, I only drive it three miles. And I actually think it's going to be cool because I really want to get a quarter million miles out of it. I mean, I'm, I'm a chite, cheap yeah, bastard, kind of and I'm at 140, and I, I, I want to get a quarter million miles out of that. And, and the bottom line, so, so you can present that, you know, well, I'll tell you what. I mean, obviously, you don't have to do anything. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever died from a dental cavity. Um, obviously, we could just do everything, and you could leave here with a brand new car, and it's going to cost you twenty five grand. Now, they don't want to hear, well, number three, we'll need an RCT build up in the ground, and number four, <laughs> we'll need. They just want to know a price. You know, yeah. when, you, when, you, when you go to a car lot and they say, how much is the car? Well, did you want a transmission? Because the transmission is going to be for well, did you want wheels on it? <laughs> well, you know, they, they just just tell, just shut up and tell me the price. Omar Reed, I watched that guy in Phoenix do it better than anyone. I mean, Omar Reed would walk up there and he'd just look in their mouth. He he'd just look at he'd already looked at their X-rays and study models. And he'd say, "Look, we could do nothing." I'm pretty sure at your funeral they're not going to say you died from a dental cavity. Um, what you're concerned about? Why you came in? You broke that tooth. We can crown that thousand bucks. We can start it today. Now, if you want to, but if you said to me, I want to leave with a perfect set of teeth, that's 25 grand. I don't care what you do, but I need to know what you want to do. Well, if you said that to five people and one said yes, we did a $25,000 dream plan. If you said it to 100 people and one said yes, you got a 25000 dream plan. I'm telling you, 90% of dentists have never done it one time in their entire life, and half their patients did it in the last five years. I mean, this, this country sells million i mean sometimes they'll sell 25 million new cars a year in this country of 325 million um clear choice they, last year they sold 18,000 arches of all on four 25 grand an arch and if you're getting upper and lower done you, you gave them 50 grand so they can do that 18,000 times a year and the dentist uh, practicing across the street has never done it one time in 40 years um so, so let, me, let me interrupt you with that a little bit though because so that's a great point I, I totally get that. My question then becomes is, how do we do that? How, how do I wh either, I mean, how do you start to do that? And then, and the other thing is, you know, I feel like it all for, and maybe this is the excuse because we've only done this for so long, but then it boils down to money and, you know, and then they don't have, and you know, with the car thing, then, you know, they don't sell $50,000 cars. They sell $300 payments, right? Like that, that's, that's the whole mindset there. But I mean, do you believe in kind of that we should be doing more payment plan stuff to make things affordable or how do we get to the point that we're confident enough to where we can present a $25,000 treatment plan and not shake in our boots? Well, a lot. okay, so in, in the United States, anything over $1,000 is financed 90% of the time. So only 10% buy purchases over $1,000, a car, a house, and cash. They're always over sixty-five. So those are the idiots you decide to give a, a discount to. Well, we're going to give you a senior citizen discount since you don't have any kids. You paid off your house. You don't have a car payment. You know, you, you should give the Mormon lady with five kids the, the, the senior citizen discount because she's broke. Uh, but, but, yeah, financing <laughs> is everything. I mean, I mean, I'm Irish, and we were saved 
uh, by Mr. Singer. There were like 85 different sewing machine companies. And when you, uh, you know, uh, one million Irish washed up on the shore after the famine, 40 years before the Statue of Liberty, and the only jobs were textiles. But in the textiles, you had to have a sewing machine. They were 50 bucks. There was a one guy from Ireland that had 50 bucks, and everybody wanted their 50 bucks. So old man Singer said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the sewing machine, and you'll get a $3 a week job. But on Friday, when you get that three bucks, you're going to come back and give old man Singer a buck. And he bankrupted everyone. Everybody says that Henry Ford started the, the assembly line. It's like, okay, but what's the end of the story? Why did they close it down? Because GMAC financing, uh, GM started GMAC financing. He said, old man Ford, he wants 668 bucks cash. You come over to GM and get a Chevy. And we're going to make installment credit. So everybody who comes to an industry with installment credit walks out as the leader. So you have to have financing. And, and the reason I love care credit most, and this is no advertisement, no money, nothing like that, sure. is because the care credit, they don't want any new patients because every dentist in America has already signed up for them and used them once. The best thing about care credit is to blow your self-limiting beliefs because they will come into your office with your staff and then you can say, what do you want to look at all the dentists in this area? You want to look by zip code? You want to look by, what do you want to look at? And they'll open up and say, okay, you, your average care credit is $400. And for your whole zip code, it's only $418. But look at these two guys, and here's their damn name. Here's their address. These guys, their average is 5000 So you're telling me that everything's wrong because of Korea and North Putin and Trump met with a Russian and, <laughs> you know, all this bullshit toxic noise because you, because you would rather backseat drive the White House than backseat drive the man in the mirror. And they'll say, well, dude, how come you're all young, good looking, hot, energetic, and you, and you only did three care credits last month for 400 and that old fat bald guy across the street did five that were over 5,000 last week. Wow. So when you see that, it really uh, checks your, your balance. I mean, most, you know, so that, that's why I love care credit. No, that's Just huge. That report. That, that, that's kind of eye opening. I mean, that I, I kind of want to go look at ours now too. Cause I feel like that's an area where we can totally the wrap in, bring the wrap in. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, we were, it's funny. You said care credit. We were number one in the country uh, when I was at the corporate because our office manager, Melinda, she did a great job of doing the care credit. We sold $900,000 that year in the care credit. Well, you don't, came from the room, you don't walk in the room saying, yeah. you know, well, you know, my God, if we, if, we, if we did everything you needed, it'd be five grand. They walk in there and they smile. How are you doing? Great. Well, I, I'm so excited because you have amazing credit. If we did everything the doctor thinks you need, it would only cost you $80 a month for three years to get everything fixed up. And the only thing you heard was, I like you, you're likable, you're sweet, I'm smiling. And who doesn't have $80 a month for three years? Boom. Yep. And on that yeah. treatment plan presentation, I always like to talk about Seinfeld, too. I, I love stand-up comedy the most. I've done it 100 times um, because, you know, there's no props, there's no monitors. You know, I don't even like comedians that pull out a puppet or a toy box or, um, I like, I respect <laughs> Broadway a hundred times more than a movie. Cause some of those movie scenes will take 30, 40 cuts where Broadway's live and Seinfeld will talk about how on Monday he'll write a joke. And then Tuesday, his whole day, he wants to take one word out of that joke, make it tighter Wednesday. He'll do the same. So he'll write a joke on Monday. And Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, the rest of the week is I don't want to say a joke in 19 words if I can say it in seven. And, and, and the quiet, the succinct, that's how humans work. So what's the dentist's response? He's staring at an x-ray babbling about a root canal for five minutes. I mean, imagine, imagine. We talk ourselves out of stuff. Oh, yeah. my God. I mean, if I went to doctor and said, hey, you need to call, you know, you're 50. You know, when I turned 50, he said, look, you're 50, so you need a colonoscopy. You need an MRI of your brain, and you need a um, – I think that was just it. And I, I just said, Diagnose. okay. And then that was it. <laughs> I mean, he didn't explain to me for an hour and a half of what could possibly – and then when I did a colonoscopy, um, you know, I walked in there. He didn't, like, show me previous video films he had shot and other people's assholes and all the things he had found <laughs> from yeah. lumps and bumps to a set of car keys. I mean, he just like, you're 50, dude, and colon cancer, you know, we, we just need to do that. It's a real okay. deal, yeah. And, and, and these dentists, they just talk and talk and talk. And, and then their treatment plan acceptance rates. And I'll, and I'll tell you one thing macroeconomically on treatment plan rates. 
What we see generally within any zip code in America is that one in three people always get their cavity filled. One in three people never get their cavity filled. But it's that you can get that one in the middle. And so the national average closure rate on just a cavity is 38%. And you'll go into a zip code and 80% of the dentists are just doing this one out of three. But then there's a practice in the same building, the same everything, doing two out of three. And the difference is one of them is likable and is really focusing on treatment plan presentation, whether docs do it himself or got a treatment plan presenter. And, and, and they know, um, and, and, and you're on your chart, you should be asking these keratinoid questions. I mean, you're asking them if they've ever had syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia. I mean, these are questions you ask in a bar on Second Avenue. Um, what the hell is that going to affect? <laughs> on my treatment plan and and that way when they go in there they're not saying well it's five thousand stress stress and we got to see if we can get your credit approved and they're thinking oh i bet my credit's horrible and it's all this stress. well no we'll just wait or just blah 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 but ask him on the deal you know fill out this form and then the treatment plan president goes in there and says oh my god congratulations you guys got amazing credit uh my god uh uh, Solly, we can do everything for eighty nine dollars a month for sixty months. So go back to that because I like this. So you're so you're saying that because that's kind of how it's been in our office and why we probably suck at it is it's be like okay, well, it's gonna be you know if we got ten thousand dollars of work, we can you know you could pay it this way or we can check your you know, we can do Care Credit Lending Club and they'll you know see if you're approved blah, blah blah. So then they go up there and then a lot of times they gotta you know I don't know I, I guess I miss out on some of it. They have to do it either at home or in the office sometimes, but, and so the, the, we're not, we're not doing that very well, clearly. Um, how, so what are you saying you try to get this, some of the stuff like pre-approved on the front end or like, or what's your, the workflow for that? Well, I, I don't, you know, I don't really care what you do as long as it works. Like I'll go, I'll go to hamburgers because, um, you know, I grew up, I cut my teeth in Sonic Drive-In. My dad owned a Sonic Drive-In. That, that's about the only place I ever saw my dad. And I spent a deck in there. That's where I learned all my business and loved it. But look at hamburgers. I mean, there's Wendy's, there's Carl's Jr., there's In-N-Out, there's McDonald's. There's a hundred ways to make a hamburger. They owned up some, what is that new one there, Five Guys or something? I never even went there, but now there's some Five Guys that have got a hamburger. and they, they weren't That's afraid. an East Coast burger, baby. Is it, they, they weren't afraid of McDonald's. They weren't afraid of Wendy's. I mean, I mean, they knew Wendy's and McDonald's and Burger King were on every corner, but they opened up right there across the street from them, ready to go. And I guess, are they doing good? And but the, but the bottom line, I don't care what you do. The first thing you got to do is start measuring it. Because I'll walk into a dentist, I'll say, "Hey, Sully, um, if you if a hundred people walk in with a cavity, how many do you close and convert to drill, fill, and bill?" And they just look at you with deer eyes. Okay, so if you don't know you're getting an F or a D, we, I, you know, what's the first rule at AA meeting? Uh, you have to admit you have a problem. You have to go in there and say, "Hey, I'm I'm Howard and I'm an alcoholic." You have to go in there and say, "I only got a 38% close rate." And then you and then you share that with your team. Like we know in our team, we we can line up everybody. We have a pecking order on who has the highest close rate. I mean, my 30-year dental assistant Jan, I mean, everybody in the office wants her to do the job, but sometimes she can't. She's busy. She's doing something else. So then who would be your second go-to person? Well, we'd want Dawn. I don't even make I don't even make the top fifty percentile, and I'm a dentist with an MBA. The <laughs> alphabet soup shit means nothing, and the terms we use five thousand words of Latin and Greek they don't even understand. But I would start measuring it first. Then I would realize, okay, if half of our patients have bought a thirty thousand dollar new car, what's the difference? Well, you you go see the car; it just says thirty grand. And then you sit there and then you go see if you can get approved. A lot of these people get approved before they go in there. But, um, you know, you're walking in the room and just saying, hey, gosh, congratulations, man. We can do the whole thing, the whole $30,000 new car for just $450 a month for 60 months. Is that something you want to do? And, 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 and so 10% of the dentists can do that every single month. It's not, yeah. it's at least 10%. And, and you had a great guy on your podcast, Danny. I mean, uh, Danny, Danny Dominique. Yeah. I mean, where's he from? Beverly Hills, Manhattan, he's, New he's York New, City, Louisiana. He's Louisiana. from Lafayette, Louisiana, okay. where you, the shoes you're wearing is what they wear in church. Uh, yeah. sandal slippers. And this guy is doing that every other day in Lafayette because he, he's got the, He's good looking. He's charming. He's succinct. You know what we do is we probably what the, about the only thing we do is just if we just took out all the teeth, place just four little implants, put a denture on there, 
It looked like a Hollywood smile. It's $25,000 an arch. We could do the upper and lower. Is, is, is that what you want to do? Well, he's, he's just all good looking and shaking your hand. And they're <laughs> like, well, yeah, yeah. Looks like I'm not going to be able to buy that F-150 Ford pickup truck this year. I'll have to buy that two years down the road. You know, it's yeah. just, that's your competition, not sure. Heartland and Aspen and Pacific across the street. So I kind of want to my the next thing I wanted to hit on before you know before we wrap up our transition Dude, are you a little bit on is me? Uh, I'm hitting <laughs> on you just a tad. <laughs> You're a little bald for my taste. I, mean, I got to, you know, um, the student loans is like the is like the biggest thing that's everybody is terrified about graduating, and it's it's you know, and you graduated and bought things in the era where it was like you know twelve percent interest only or fifteen percent whatever. And yeah, student loans are high. They're getting seven, eight percent. But we're seeing that over and over and over be a big fear, and, a, and it is a reality. But a big fear of holding, you know, new graduates back. So I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on, you know, how do we deal with that, and what are the the ways to overcome that and look past that to continue to invest in yourself and your practice and make yourself grow, but managing that too. Hey, and your retirement. That, is that a uh, Dr. Hosslinger coming in? No. <laughs> hey. How are you, sir? How are you? <laughs> Tommy. Sorry, you're, good. Right. you're good. Potential patient, maybe. <laughs> Potential patient? You, you, you guys need uh, – I mean, I'll say <laughs> you guys need to talk to <laughs> Payment will take this. We'll keep going. This well, I, I, w- I, would, I would say this, that, that number one, student loan debt is not anyone's problem. The only problem that you'll ever have lives in between your ears. It's all these self-limiting beliefs. It's, you know, you're your own – worst enemy no one else is going to be your enemy you talk about a three hundred fifty thousand dollars student loan you think that's bad what percent of that class will eventually walk out there and buy a house someday that costs more than three hundred fifty thousand most of them all All of them them. what percent of them will get divorced half of them half of them what's the average divorce cost in dentistry super expensive i would imagine i've never seen one under a million mine was 3.8 million Oh, it was gosh. 87 times. Uh, I what, what's uh, oh, whatever. Let me let me take that. Was, uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, I should know this number now. I You're probably, probably not bitter about that at all. But but the the bottom line is, uh, um, Ryan, take take 3.8 million divided by 87 thousand. I'm just curious myself. My divorce cost me 43 times more than my damn student loan deal. The reason you're not opening up a dental office is not because you have student loans, not because you're going to buy a house bigger than that someday, not not because you're going to get divorced for millions. The reason you <laughs> des- you know what to do. Start your own business. You've just decided not to do it. I mean, it's like I'm fat. I know when I'm eating ice cream that I shouldn't be. I know I should never eat that shit again, but I decided I'm going to eat it anyway. You know that if you have $350,000 of student loans working for Aspen and making $125,000 a year and then paying taxes, and then you get comfortable, so you go buy a house and a car and start eating out three nights a week, that it's a trap and you're going to be there forever. They, they pay you just enough to kill all your dreams. I mean, they're like, now you're coming home and your wife's pregnant and has a kid. And she's like, well, you make $125,000 a year. My mama only makes $25,000. And I don't know, it seems risky to walk away from that job and start your own business. And why don't we just stay put and kill all of our dreams and you go work for the man for the rest of your life. And the bottom line, you know you should start a dental off. So it's not the student loans. I mean, you borrowed three hundred and fifty. dollars but you can't borrow twice that amount to buy an existing office. It's just, it's just all in your head. I graduated May 11th of 87, and my office saw its first patient September 21, 87. That was a couple months. And, I, 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 and I'd only had done like 50 fillings, you know, what was it, 14 units of endo, you know, 10 sure. units of removable. I mean – well, my thing is too is like you're investing in yourself. Like if you look at one thing, I mean, and the default rate on dental practices is like super low. You know, it's point so, four percent. So ninety nine point six percent make it with a point four percent default rate. Yeah, that to me, like right there, is is huge. And like you said, the idea of learning like three hundred fifty thousand dollars is a lot of money. But the reality is, you know, I mean, we're both over a million dollars in debt now between you know practices and houses and things. And so it's like learning to kind of be comfortable with the debt is good. What are your thoughts? I mean, the other thing I'm seeing is that I'd like to kind of touch on, in, which is I think part of the problem is, is we have a lot of your age group, um, like my dad, who is How not old is your dad? In 54. 
53. So God, I think I'm he graduated. Same, he's born, so I'm same age, 54. So I'm your dad. Yeah. I think I'll he graduated be, 88. I'll be your other dad. Yeah, you'd be your other dad. So, you know, <laughs> Papa, Papa Ferran. So, um, so, you know, is that that generation is, is now starting to get on cruise control slash, you know, going down. They're not investing in their practices. They're stopping to invest in technology. They're trying to tighten up because they haven't done well in retirement. And so they're trying to get real lean because they think they're going to take home more. And so now you have – they're less willing to hire associate dentists. And so there's not a lot of you know, associateship type practices that it seems for new graduates to get a part of. Do you see where, what I'm talking about or do you, do you think that's an oh, issue? I, say, or? I, I would say this. Um, you know, when I was a little kid, you always heard all your older grandpas and uncles and everybody in the community. There's a big conspiracy theory that the only reason America always went to war is because it was so good for the economy. Well, when you – World War II, you destroyed – Germany and Japan, those were the only two countries that made cars and refrigerators and anything you wanted to buy. So that was really good for the American economy. All the war since then, you've gone to <laughs> war with countries that don't sell one don't make thing shit. at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> so wars are a total expense. I, I'm all for war if it's against all the countries that make everything at Walmart, okay? But if they don't yeah. make anything at Walmart, you're wasting your damn time. And the, the point being, after you destroy that competition – after World War II, there was this massive expansion of wealth because if the only place that wasn't leveled and you could buy anything was the United States. Well, they still think that they were the greatest generation, and they, they think we can go back to that time. They act like Germany and Japan don't exist. Now it's not even Germany and Japan anymore. Hell, it's Italy and France yeah. and Denmark and China and India. South I mean, I mean, yeah. everybody on Earth is making – I mean, Brazil sells airplanes. Can you believe someone can make an airplane wearing a thong? I mean, <laughs> I mean, every country is making amazing shit that's showing up everywhere in the world. So, so yeah, this – this post World War II, that from 1945, you just do your time 40 years and the Fortune 500, get your pension, go home and go play. Those days are completely gone and they're never coming back unless there's some massive war in Europe, which there could be. I mean, they, were, they did it twice last century. I mean, if they did it just one more really good time this time, you know, maybe those days could come back. But then you have China already outproducing them. I mean, you would you would you would need the whole Eastern Hemisphere to go up in flames to return that mentality from 1945 to 1980, and it's it's gone and it's not come back. So yeah, those dentists are gonna basically. When, when, when do you think a, a dentist is gonna wake up Sunday and say, you know what, I never need another dollar again? He's thinking at 60, he's thinking, well, I'm gonna retire at 65, and then at 63, his wife says, Let, let's do a cruise in Italy. Okay, we'll retire at 66. And then at 65, she's like, you know, we need to replace our cars. And then just when every man thinks the house is finally all fixed up, what does your wife say? You know, we let's need remodel. all new furniture and let's paint and let's remodel because everything's perfect. So let's just, you know, just destroy $50,000 in capital <laughs> and put all new different colored shit in the house. So it, it, it never ends. It's the pattern. It's the pattern behavior. So, yeah, these guys aren't going to retire. I did a de novo. I think the most important, um, the, the, I would say financial things that um, bother me about millennials is like Arizona has two dental schools. They're both private. They're very expensive. These, these kids are coming out of there at 350 There's a lot of Mormons in Arizona and Utah. They come out with two kids, and they're 550000 in debt. And their mom and their mother-in-law live right up the street. And it's like, okay, dude, you need to go back home and you need to live with your parents and you need to drive a thousand dollar jalopy and you need to start your own office. You need to live below your means hardcore for 10 years. Oh, hell no. They go, well, I've already got two kids, so I need a five bedroom house. And I was $500,000 in debt and I got a $500,000 house and my sweetie wants the hottest SUV because she didn't want to pull up in the LDS parking lot, the only one not driving a new a new Suburban, and, and they just live so far above their means. And then you do it with this technology stuff. Your dad, you know, here, here's, here's you and your, your, here's how my walnut brain, your dad walnut, we, we buy a $17 Impergum impression from 3M. We send it up <laughs> the street, and he makes a $99 zirconium crown, and we cement it. Here's what you do. Well, why would you want a $17 impression 
when you can have a $17,000 3M true definition scanner because dad's not investing in technology. And why send it to the lab man for $99 when I can buy a $150,000 CAD CAM machine and mill it chair side? Because my lab man, he's made 10,000 crowns in 20 years, but I've never made one. So I th my best idea is I should make them. Or I'll have my assistant make them because she's never made a crown either. And, and, and 2D Pano... I mean, how does an orthodontist, if, if an orthodontist can't do ortho with a pano and a saf, he needs, what, what does he need, a Ouija board? Well, I think I'm just going to get a $100,000 CBCT. You guys buy every gosh darn piece of technological needless <laughs> shit every time you turn around. And that's the other thing I see. When you see a, when you see a boomer like me driving a Lexus, it's paid for. Yeah. When you see a millennial kid driving a Lexus, it's it's probably leased or it's on a five year payment plan. It's just living beyond your means. I mean, you just I mean, a fool and their money always part. And in my 30 years of dentistry, I'm in Phoenix. I'm across the street from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation. Lots of people over there, dirt floors, undocumented workers. A lot of them are from Mexico coming and going. I've never had one not pay their bill in cash. Who are the only people that jerk my chain? Millionaires. And so your daddy is 54. He's got bank, so he ain't parting with it. A millennial doesn't have a dollar. I mean, they got $500,000 student loans, bought a practice. They don't even, money is just, it's all negative. So why not just add more? They spend sure. money they don't have. And, and, you know, if you walk into a study club and you say, you know, I think the fastest, easiest, cheapest way to do a crown is just with three burrs, a triple tray impression and send it to old man Frank up the street for $99. Everybody's like, well, you're just kind of a horrible person and a, and a dick and a bad dentist. I <laughs> bought a, I bought an oral scanner and a CAD CAM machine and I send my x-ray to Denmark and, and, nah, 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 nah. and you're like, yeah, dude. And you're going to be paying interest on other people's money when you're 60. Well, so, and, so my millennial, only argument I that. wish a millennial was synonymous with the word minimalism. I wish millennial meant minimalism. They lived at home. They drive used cars. They save their money. But it just seems like they part with that money more than any generation I've laid eyes on. No, we're bad about that. We want it. We want it now. We don't want to wait for it. We feel like when we graduated, we've earned something and probably gotten somewhere. Really, we're just getting to square one. Now, I think I, I disagree a little bit with like some of the technology and that I feel like, you, you know, what's going to I feel like especially the older dentists who are kind of you know, cruising though, if you, if you're going to stop investing in the technology, eventually you're going to get passed by our generation because we're going to be able to do it faster, cheaper, better. And that's what patients. Okay. Want name to name the technology that's going faster, cheaper, better that the old people should get. Well, I think same day crowns is one that sh that's going to be that's, in the I city. Mean, that is so bullshit. I mean, I've been a dentist for 30 years. I tell anybody in Arizona, they need a crown. They only got two questions. Oh my God, I'm, I'm afraid. Are you going to give me a shot? <laughs> or, oh my God, how much is that going to cost? Well, yeah, but, you, but exactly. But your point cost. though. Only your, your, your cost. And all you hear is they want it same day. But your point though is, is that's a 30 year. That's, that's the past 30 years. I think the next 30 years are going to be. I don't want to take off work. That's two days. I'm losing money. I need to be able to come in and get the crown done and be gone. I think that's the future of where we're going to. I mean, that's, that's how, and, 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 and along with that is it's the same way. I mean, our generation, when we call, we want something. We want it now. If we, if you don't answer your phone, we're going to the next dentist, yeah, the next that, person. That I agree you know? with a thousand percent. And so, and so I think we have to start to think about how we're doing dentistry I, differently a little bit, just because the mm -hmm. consumer's changing. I, I tend to, I'm going to say this, Howard, I'm, I tend to disagree with uh, Soli in, in this regard of as far as the same day crown. I love the technology, but the same day doing something, and Howard said it from trying to do something that the lab guy did for so many years and trying to replicate that into do it yourself or teach, uh, train your staff to make these crowns, especially when you start talking about aesthetic or anterior, because I don't think it's worth it. I honestly don't think it's worth it. I don't, in the long term, in the long run, I don't really see it, the use. I would say if you could make a good relationship with the lab and become that $90, $95, because that's what I do. I'm, I'm getting my crowns for 80 something. Yeah, but it's also a numbers game too from a standpoint of like the volume you're doing for one. No, I'm talking about doing the, uh, yes, but Howard's how saying, I think in the long run, 
when you have a practice but that's established. Howard, when was the last time a the, – and maybe you're a bad example, but when was the last time a lab guy sent you an impression back and, and didn't send the crown back? Sent the impression back and not the crown. Like they, they called you and said, I'm going to need a new impression. Oh, uh, well, you know um, – that's something that you, you get better at. That, that, let, me, let me rant on that. Because my, my, my point is, is, though, is like I think the one thing that's nice about sort of like CAD CAM dentistry, and obviously I believe that, is that you – know, you know, and I get that. I see your point that the lab guys make crowns for 20 years, and so he's going to be better at that. But the difference is, is like they could also make your shit do better. And so I think that one of the benefits of doing – milling your own crowns and some of that is it makes you a better dentist because they're, they're not sending – the majority of labs aren't sending – because if they were sending back every impression that sucked because they, they're, they're making it work, right? They're figuring out how to make it work so that you don't have to – because then you're going to find another lab that's going to do well, that. You see my what, point? What, what percent of your friends – you've been out of school two years. What percent of all your classmates are right now in associate position? What would you say? Probably – Thirty-five percent. Most of them. No, a say. lot of them are corporate or yeah, yeah, Are you talking I, about? I mean, an, an employee corporate. somewhere. Whether it be okay, okay. Maybe let's say let's say sixty percent. Let's say sixty percent are employees. Sixty percent are employees. Whether it's their dad, private sector, associate. How many sure. of those sixty percent are happy and say, "I want to stay here forever," or do they have major issues with who they're working for, whether it's private or corporate or whatever? I'd probably say. 20% of those. I would say half of them, they, half of them are not, half of them are happy, half of them become content as time goes on. They just get used to that style of dentistry. Um, so it's just very hard to say. So you'd but say I would half, half of them aren't happy. Correct. And is that any more likely to occur at corporate or private or is it about the same? Same ratio? I would say it happens more in a corporate than associateship, whether as if you know somebody. Yeah. So, the, and what percent I'm, to the doctor they're working for, they say, man, that's just a humble, laid-back guy. I really like that guy. He's a mentor of mine. I can go to him with any problem, question. Versus how many of them say, he's kind of a dick. I'd probably say 10% were the mentor of that half group. I mean, it's a small – I would imagine that – One out of four. I would say 25 The majority maybe. of them probably don't have that idea of relationship. Yeah, okay. So the bottom line is the natural selection. When, when you have to get A's in calculus, physics, geometry – you got some guy who sat in the library, learned all this shit, thinks he's all that in a bag of chips. And these lab people, every single one of them are afraid of you. They, they're, you're, you're a doctor. You're, if, you, if, you go to, if you go to any – hell, just go walk up to a stranger in the street and say, hey, um, can I ask you a question? I want you to describe a uh, – not a, not a doctor, not a lawyer, but a dentist. Describe a dentist in three words. Listen to their three words. Uh, arrogant, condescending, <laughs> asshole. You know, and, and then these labs, so these labs can't call you up and say, hey, you're young, you're out of school. I could show you a few tricks. I've made 20,000 crowns. You ought to come over. They're afraid you're going to say, what? My crown's not perfect? You're an sure. idiot. You retake the impression, you Neanderthal. I'm sending it to someone else. You have to use, I want you to use a lab that you can drive over there to. You have to establish your likability and trust. You got to go there and say, hey, how you doing, dude? I'm two years out of school. I don't want to send my lab clear across the country to somebody I can't talk to. Um, I want to come in here, and I want to tell you that I'm sure anybody who's done 10, 100 times more crowns than me learned something I didn't learn. And, the, and they walked. For me, that was um, an old German guy. Oh, my gosh. What was his name? Wolfgang. God dang, it was 87. I wonder if that guy's alive. I hope he didn't. I hope he's not alive and heard <laughs> me just ask that on the phone or on the podcast. And, and you know, I, I called him and I said, hey, um, how, how did my impression look? And it was just like dead silence. And he's like, uh, do, you, do you have a question? I said, well, you know, I went to University of Missouri, Kansas City. There's guys out here from UCLA and USC. I mean, did, did, is it good? And it's just like a dead pause. And, 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 and I mean, he was afraid Blood to say away. anything. So finally, I went down there and he spent like half a day. He walked, I mean, there's a hundred in pans and he's showing me all this stuff and he's showing me the death guys. He, and he taught me one perfect lesson. He goes, he goes, you know why I had to send you a reduction coping? And I said, because I didn't reduce enough? He said, no. Because you took the impression before you made the temporary. You could not have put a temporary on that tooth and adjusted the temporary and not have drilled right through that temporary. But what did you do? Lazy. You took the impression left, and you had Jan make the temporary. And Jan probably took 30 minutes to make temporary. You and Jan <laughs> could have made the temporary together in four minutes, and you could have worked out if you can't see the impression on the temporary, then how are you going to find it in the impergum? If you don't have the reduction of the temporary, how are you going to have, you know, so, 
So Jan and I listened to this guy, and he said, you only need three burrs, blah, 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 blah. And we would sit there and do the prep. We'd pack a zero cord. We'd pack a one cord. We'd make the temporary. I mean, sometimes you take the temporary off. You're trimming the temporary with loops on. You're like, well, where the hell's the margin? Well, it probably it's, doesn't exist. But you could see that better on a white acrylic temporary than you could on a per dark purple emperor gum. I still don't know why. Why don't they just change it to black? I mean, they're only like one color away from mm -hmm. the worst color of reflecting light. Do they even make a, like a, a light body either or something that goes with it? Or is it just, it's yeah, just the purple a, emperor gum? No, there's a light body with the emperor We gum. still use it because I work with a 54-year-old. So, well, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, the shit works. White, white. And it tastes terrible. It, works. <laughs> it does no, work actually, really I'm good. I love the polyether. It's good. It's rigid. <laughs> and actually for temporaries. I tell my assistants to use it for temporaries. Um, makes it so snug when you put it on. So you're not anti-technology. You're just saying I'm, that basically, I'm look. not anti-technology. It's just that if, if buying a CAD cam is exactly like buying a Steinway piano. When you get that piano delivered, it's going to take you 10,000 hours to learn how to play Beethoven. Your lab man already did the 10,000 hours. And a lot of dentists, you say, do you like lab work? Hell no, I hate lab work, but I like technology. Okay, that, that makes no sense. And, and, and then if you don't like it, then you tell your assistant to do it. But what I'm looking at is you bought this $150,000 piece of technology where every two or three years, you need to come back and give them 6000 more for whatever. Um, you, you, That's true. You buy these oral <laughs> scanning technologies, and they say, well, uh, yeah, and we need a $200 a month in perpetuity um, for your lease up where updates, 200 a month. Shit, I'm not buying 200 a month in Emperor Gum. Now I just have to give you 200 a month just for my update bullshit. Mm -hmm. And I'm still missing $17,000 that if this market tanked tomorrow, wouldn't you like to buy $17,000 of uh, Google or Facebook or Apple if it tanked tomorrow? Mm -hmm. But no, you, but you don't, uh, it just seems like every time a millennial has a great idea, it always involves a shitload of debt. That's why I tell millennials, just quit thinking. It's just true. You know, every time, in fact, I, I joke to millennials that they should go into the dental office and have a big old whiteboard every morning at the staff that'll say, hey, I woke up this morning with a great idea and I'm going to write it down and I pay you guys not to let me do it, okay? <laughs> this, this is my idea and it always involves debt, credit card, leasing, buying, and here's my idea. Why don't you go in there in the morning and say, hey, um, we work 16 days a month and all of our bills for everything, you, me, everything, we have to do $2,000 to break, to, to break even. So let's go do 2000 and then we'll go to lunch. Oh, that ain't millennials are. Millennials say, well, we had a cancellation 11 uh, to 12. So we just sat around on Facebook and then at 12, we went to lunch because we're an entitled like the government. And I'm like, I'm like, well, you're entitled to going to lunch at 12. You didn't even pay the bills yet. And, and, and if you had a cancellation 11, why don't you eat a banana right then? Because someone's on the phone at 1130 and they said they could get here at noon. And we told them they can come down. We don't give a shit about your lunch hour. We're going to hit our BAM number, our bare ass minimum break even point. Then we can take a break. And then we're going to come back and do it again. If we come back and do it again, we got 50% overhead. But I go in there and they, 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 they get in there at 730. They don't even turn the phones on until 805. They're going to lunch at 12 to 1, even if the entire morning canceled and no-showed. And they're leaving at 5, even though the doctor might have lost money for the day. And if you want 50% overhead, you know what to do. You just decide you're not going to do it. You decide, well, uh, you know, it's fair that since I got a dental school, I should get a new car. It's fair that I should eat lunch from 12 I to 1, even though I'm morbidly obese. It's I don't fair. think that's generational, though. I think that's. I mean, I think that's. I don't think that's just millennial. I think that's all dentists. I mean, I think the majority of dentists aren't looking at those things and doing those things. I mean, I think that's why most dentists aren't retiring. Why most dentists are working at sixty-five because they're 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 doing all those things you're you're saying. I think the difference actually with us, where you know, I mean, yes, there's a, a, a the problem is with with the world we live in now with social media, the access to information that all the shit millennials do is just now. It's broadcast to the world, so I feel like our the 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 ten percent that do really stupid stuff end up becoming the the name for the majority of us, right? And so, but but the flip side of that though is that you know that's where I say, and I, and I know you, you you we joke and laugh, but <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a lot of really talented millennials out there who are young dentists who are going to utilize a lot of this, and the, I mean the access to information. I mean what we can learn now that what what you know you had to fly somewhere, do something. And I'm not saying that going to places is bad. I'm a huge advocate of that. But you know, our access to information 
is incredible. And so if we will actually use it and utilize it, we can get really good really quick and, and really help ourselves improve to where that I think that's where the, the older dentist is going to have to be careful because, you know, we're going to make ourselves a lot more attractive to patients uh, because of a lot of things you're talking about that they're not doing. You know, um, I agree with the transparency thing because, like, people always say, well, if poverty was related to crime. Well, how come we didn't have any crime during the Great Depression from 32 to 36? Uh, because no one wrote it down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. if someone come and stole your cow, I mean, how would we know that? You know what I mean? Right. I mean, they, they just don't know. Um, yeah, I think all people are the same. I, I don't I think millennials, the differences between millennials will be, um, you know, it's that generational pattern. Everybody thinks the next generation is not doing good. I think that every generation gets smarter. Hell, in 1880, 80% of the planet couldn't read or write. Now we have four and a half billion out of seven and a half billion people living in a house with a smartphone with 52 million pages of Wikipedia. I think when Jobs stuck the internet and the smartphone from 2007, that next hundred years will be the greatest century we've ever had because we're going to go from illiteracy to literacy. But I do think this is undeniable about um, millennials. I mean, when I was a little kid, Every farmer I knew worked sun up to sundown on their farm seven days a week. Um, every dad I knew that had the eight to five job as whatever had a weekend job. Um, I one of my friends I went to dental school with uh, from the seventh grade to the dental school. His uh, mom and dad uh, were both a pharmacist, and they both had part time jobs, and they were pharmacists. And I just see, and then and then I see. You, you go to hire are, an associate. You go to a, an associate and say, well, how about um, two nights a week you say till seven? What? Well, I, I, I'm not saying till seven. Oh, how about one Saturday a month you come in for four hours? Hell no. What do you think? Yeah. I'm an idiot? You want no, me to say till seven and work one four-hour Saturday a month? Are you out of your freaking mind? It's like, dude, your grandpa on Sunday would get up his yeah. son up, and he had farm chores till he couldn't walk, <laughs> and it was dark, and he couldn't see. And you can't do one four hours. I mean, I mean, I'm telling you, a lot of people say um, the millennials have less children. You know, uh, later in life, they're going to have less kids because they treat a child as like a, an economic purchase. They'd rather have vacation and condo. I say the birth rates declining with millennials is because they're too lazy to fuck. <laughs> <laughs> there may be, there may be, we're working too hard. <laughs> this has been fantastic. I, uh, I think so many of this stuff is, I mean, the, I'm excited. The financing thing, I'm going back first thing Monday morning, and we're going to reevaluate that. Um, and all this stuff has been really, really important. So the word of wisdom, I really honestly, everything you said that. is so true. I cannot agree with you in every single subject as far as what <laughs> the pattern, especially about <laughs> the pattern of how this generation is not really a generational thing. It just it keeps coming and going and and just the way that everything you explained, what do you, one quick thing I'd like to um, ask you, and I don't know if you mind sharing with me, the, the future of Dental Town and the future of education and CE online versus what you want to do with the whole that's Dental another, Town. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, my generation, if you wanted to learn from Carl Misch, you bought his damn textbook for $118 and you read his textbook. Your generation has to fly across the country, stay in a resort, drop $5,000 for a weekend. And, and um, like on Dentaltown, we, we but put it's up, a write off. We, we <laughs> put up saying. 450 courses. And some of these, like, like the endo continuum, I mean, people don't realize this, but that endo continuum that's like 30, 21 hours long. Cost one million dollars and a decade to film and tape, and you can wow. buy that for you can buy that for less than the cost of flying Southwest Airlines uh, to whatever institute you're going for. I mean, it seems like yeah. every time they want to learn one thing, they'll come back from an institute where they drop four grand on a weekend on TMJ, and I'll just sit there at the bar and saying, "Hey, you know, to just here's a piece of paper, here's a pencil, just please, just write down everything you know now that you didn't know." They can't even fill up a page. And I'm like, God, Absolutely. we could Google Amazon books and type TMJ. There, there's a gazillion TMJ courses on Dentaltown for 18 bucks, but the way you did it costs four grand. 
No, so, it is so true. And it's funny that you brought that up because I get a lot of people ask me about the implant. And, uh, my age, my group, my a uh, lot of my colleagues ask me about, oh, what's the next implant course? What's the best implant course? And and there are so many of them these days, so many organization, association. And my number one thing I tell every single one is what you said about buy Carl Mish's textbook. And you start reading a little bit about just the terminology, vocabulary, what abutment is, what what's uh, what's impression coping and know a little bit more than before you go to any of these weekend five thousand dollar courses because not only that five thousand dollar you might not even use it because again we go back to like having the patient having all of that implemented in your practice before you do any of these sort of ce's of spending five grand but at the same time that um, just education, they textbooks and things like you said, 17 bucks that you could get on a, on a fingertip on dental town. Those are some of the great things a lot of young dentists could use right out of school. And on the same lines, I feel like the other issue kind of just goes back to the 5,000 in the resort and all that is we also just want to live in the city. I mean, we don't, we're not willing to, you know, you think with $350,000 debt, we would be willing to go work in rural area and make bank and pay that off and then move around. I mean, we, we don't really. See, that's the that problem with, with rural areas right now. Dentistry is amazing. <laughs> I feel like so much money you could make. A, I had a prosthodontist friend who called from Montana, and he was asking about a denture clinic and extraction. I was like, dude, I want to get on this with you because I already know it's a great, great thing to do in a rural area. You can do so much money. And, and they, and Melinda, here's another deal. Not only are they lazy and entitled, they won't walk <laughs> past five. They won't come in on a Saturday. But look at their look at their grandparents. Their grandparents came from another country with the shirt on their back, in a land they didn't speak the language, and you mm -hmm. can't go a mile away from Memphis. That's lazy. <laughs> the good part though is, you is, you know, is, you know is as entitled <laughs> is entitled and uh, what was the other word you said we were? We were entitled and what? Lazy. And lazy. lazy. As so an you entitled lazy, lazy are, I to remember the word lazy. <laughs> well, I got, I got, I, well, I got, I kind of was like, tech gum, screw you. Well, but the, the, my thing is, it's like as entitled as I am, and as much as I want it now, you know, that's also one of the things that I think that those of us that are going to be very successful, that's what drives us. Because you know what? Yeah. yeah, I want it now, and I don't have a problem with that. But you know what? I'm going to do. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to go freaking get it. And so I think there's a difference between some. You know, some young dentists and some millennials or whatever you want to call them that you know, they are entitled lazy and they want it to just come to them. But at the same time, there's a lot of them that's going to be – it's going to allow – it's going to push them. And I think that's where we're going to be really successful because we're going to take advantage of exactly what you said. We're going to take advantage of the fact that we can get a, a full-on endo continue on Daniel Town for you know, not much money or that I can go watch tons of YouTube videos on how to do locator dentures or you, know, you, you name it. So the flip side – you know, I, I get that part, but you know, my thing is too is like, man, if you're a young dentist, take freaking advantage of all this because we have the opportunity to be so much, you know, more uh, educated and learn so much more quickly and make so much more money so earlier on our career than y'all did because of the access to information. Yeah, um, you know, everything's got to pass my four finger test. Is this the fastest, the easiest, the lowest cost, and the highest quality? And I can learn. I mean, I, I did a podcast yesterday with a with a occlusion TMJ guy from Canada. He's written four textbooks, and you can buy them all for ninety nine dollars. A millennial wow. wouldn't consider that. He'd say, "Well, wouldn't it be easier for me to just fly to Canada and stay in a resort and go skiing at Banff on the side, and then miss half his lecture?" Uh, you know, so. And the real, then, the then, real part is we probably would be like, well, that doesn't sound fun and flashy and entertaining, so we want to go take the implant course. That's the, that's the other but part. But let me tell you about the implants because it's the same pattern. It's not right or wrong. It's just the same pattern that we talked about earlier. Don't send your crown and bridge across the country. Find somebody who's done 10,000 crowns in your town that you can meet with, and when you show up there, you know, call them and say – you you gotta you gotta pretend you're humble. You gotta say, hey, you want me to pick up a sub sandwich, a couple of tacos, you want a Wendy's burger? Just <laughs> just something so he realizes this is actually that one human dentist that we kept hearing about that would show up one day riding a unicorn, dating the tooth fairy, <laughs> and and then you know, and get a relationship and you say, Look, if you can make me better, please let me know. Well, that's how you learn implants. So almost in Memphis, probably Two-thirds of all the periodontists, oral surgeons, uh, think in fear and scarcity. They don't want you to learn it. They just want you to refer to it. They're like, look, you if you want to do implants right, you send them all to me because I'm an oral surgeon and you're a Neanderthal. And, uh, you know, I've done 10,000. I did implants before you were born. You know, 
But one third mm-hmm. realizes this pattern, which is a very interesting pattern. The number one thing you learn at learning how to do Invisalign and implants is you become a better diagnostician and you see it and you train mm-hmm. it's all in your head. Now, every dentist eventually figures out that whatever you learn, if you don't do it at least one time a week, which is 50 times a year, you're never going to make money at it. So you get into sleep apnea. Well, if you better do a sleep apnea appliance every week because if you're doing one once a month, you're so slow and efficient, you lose money. Same with implants. You can't place, you cannot make one dollar in profit placing 20 implants a year you're not fast enough good enough every time there's an implant out your assistants are like okay now what do we do again and your failure rates off the chart what if you needed a vasectomy would you want to go to some guy who does it every day or every other month every day yeah so so the the litmus test for profitability is once a week well the really smart thinking and hope, growth, and abundance, periodontist, oral surgeon, orthodontist, they all know that. They know that everybody that went to Richard Litz and Brock Rondeau and Sheridan and Harry Green, everybody got into ortho two years later, like, screw this. I don't even want to do it. So they're sitting there. I know orthodontists who will tell everybody in a, in a one-hour drive, hey, if you want to learn Invisalign, I got a little Invisalign study club. It's a, it's a first Wednesday every month. Bring your cases. I'll help you. Because he knows you just want to do crown and bridge and fillings and root canals, and you're not going to be doing Invisalign. And even if you do them, now he's got a relationship with you. So you want to learn how to place implants? You don't need to go to goddamn Dominican Republic. You tell me no one will teach you how to place implants in Memphis, Tennessee for oh, free? Agree. Are you yeah. shitting me? Yeah. And a lot of these periodontists, they like they want to extend their social network but they're afraid of their own shadow. They're introverts, they're geeks. It scares them when they even see themselves in the mirror. And, and, and and now you're going to be their friend and they'll say, Oh yeah, well, you know, I'll, I'll line up my surgeries (laughs) on your day off or the time that's whatever. And then you meet their rep and then she's, and then you, you get this social network. I mean, you should be able to learn all your Invisalign, all your implants without driving one hour from your house for free. But that's how our generation did it. And those are some of my best drinking buddies on earth. I mean, the people I go get sure. drunk with watching an Arizona Cardinals game and eating a bunch of healthy wings are dentists in my zip code who practice across the street. When two thirds of the dentists across the street live in fear and scarcity and all that, you saw my patient. I saw your patient. I mean, <laughs> What what it was it is it, was it a slave? I mean, is it chained up in your basement? I mean, <laughs> how, how did how did this happen? I didn't I didn't know that you owned a patient, and I didn't know I I thought you couldn't own anybody in the world. And but but the one third of all those dentists, just like you two, I just love the fact that there's three homie dentists on Dental Town who show up in a dental office and sit on the couch, and uh, I, I that is I mean you're already successful. You're already successful because what you just did, that pattern, you can now go do it with an orthodontist learning design, an oral surgeon and periodontist to learn implants. Just do everything faster, smarter, easier, lower, higher quality. So ask yourself, so, well, what's the cheapest way to learn endo? Should I fly all the way to California, to Santa Monica, and go listen to mm-hmm. Cliff Ruddle, or should I buy the endo textbook? I, if I don't like reading um, what would be cheaper? The the Indo course online by the same damn instructor, uh, <laughs> you know, for for nineteen bucks. And and if you just start living by those rules, is this faster? Is this easier? Is this higher quality? Is this lower cost? What do you think I learn more from? Going to Carl Misch, sitting in his lecture for eight flipping hours, or reading his damn textbook? Probably reading the textbook. And what do you think was more organized? And which one sure, had yeah. less jokes about his ex-wives? Uh, which, 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 <laughs> sure. you know, I mean, it was just... I don't know. Maybe the text might be done. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, if I, and I would just really promote minimalism. And, and the thing that you're going to learn about minimalism is that when you buy a big house, it's a money pit. Um, everything you buy, well, if I'm going to buy a boat, that'll make me happy. Okay. Now you spend all your weekends trying to get your damn boat running. You got to go half the, half the time you deal with your boat, you're taking it in out, you're doing all this bullshit. You know, Janice Joplin said it the best. She said, freedom is when you have nothing left to lose. And gosh, darn it. I can't tell you how many retired patients I had that had million dollar homes and all that all throughout Minnesota, North Dakota, and Canada, they sold freaking everything, came down to Phoenix and bought either a trailer or a thousand square foot, one bedroom, two bedroom house. They say, oh my God, I just feel free. 
I don't have to mow that big yard. I don't have all that shit to take care of. That's good advice. I got nothing but cash. Minimalism makes you happy. And these people that buy the biggest house, the biggest boat, the biggest car, the biggest Taj Mahal dental office, usually 20% of them end up at the Betty Ford Center. The other half end up divorced. Um, they're eating Vicodin just to try to control the, their depression. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, they say you get divorced over three things, a third money, a third sex, and a third substance abuse. And if you combine the first two, if you start using money to buy sex, it's even worse. So it's, it's money, <laughs> sex, and substance abuse. And a lot of those dysfunctions um, are because you're under a lot of stress. You're living in a rat cage. And you got this big nut. You drive to work. And, and, and also on that BAM number, when, when your staff is always going to come to you want to raise, because raises are always based only on astrology. They say, hey, um, the earth has just gone around the sun. So I need another dollar. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, in that journey, when that earth went around the sun, when it started a year ago, our break-even point number was 2000. So we went around the sun and now our break-even point is 2,500. And wasn't that because you wanted all those uh, instruments that aren't sharpened and you wanted this and you wanted that and you want a new autoclave. How come every time you come in here, my break-even point goes up and then you want more money? Why don't, why don't I tell you this? Why don't, why don't we have the earth go around the sun, and if you can lower my BAM number, I'll give you more money? Are we doing yeah, everything like faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost? Lower cost. I love it. That's fantastic. And, and that's, you're not going to lunch up. until we hit our BAM number. You're not entitled to lunch. And, and I'll tell you what, if, if we don't break even till 3 o'clock – and we close at 5, and at 4.30, someone calls up with a toothache, and we know they're going to give us their credit card for a root canal, bill, and crown. Somebody is going to stay Wrong. here and yeah, do that staying. root canal, bill, and crown. Someone is going to assist that doctor, and if that assistant don't know how to check them out and take the money or whatever, then someone up front's going to stay because we didn't break even till 3, so that $2,000 at the end of the day is nothing but net, and then we're back to our goal. And then when we go through the month, if we're coming up on the end of the month and we're not going to hit our break-even point, then you say, you know what? I'm going to have to open up Saturday. Yeah, I'm going to open up the – you celebrate the deal. Um, this is Monday, but I'm going to go ahead and open up Saturday because uh, right now um, we're going to have to do $4,000 a day for four days. It's not going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to blow up on Saturday. And then, <laughs> and then they might start saying, well, how about, how about, how about this? How about we just, we just do it? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. How about we're just going to do it? We're going to get the, we're going to sell the treatment. We're going to collect the money. We'll work through lunch. We're going to stay late because a millennial would rather go to hell than come in on Saturday. <laughs> that's probably true. Well, we, we just got to do that, you know, and that's part of it's tricky because that's counterintuitive to what the rest of our friends and who, you know, our other millennial buddies are doing, you know, they're living on debt and doing that stuff. So it's kind of yeah. tricky, but it is what it is. Well, hey, well, dude, I'm, thank you so much. I'm so proud of you guys. I love your uh, – oh, and I want to make one more point about this. Okay. So if – you know you, you know that you think different than me a baby more. You know that you're – the generation ahead of us, they call that the silent generation. And the one before that was the greatest generation, whatever the hell. I see these website bounce rates. Like, like I fall in love with you guys. On this podcast, I see you. It's it's like we're in the same room. This is this is something I never thought was possible when I was in dental school. Sure. And and, and then I go to your website, and it's like it's like a, a, a mugshot when you got your DUI. And and <laughs> like ten people go to your website for one that converts and calls the office. You millennials, you like Yelp. I've never even seen Yelp. I've never seen a baby boomer dentist in my life pull out Yelp. I mean, I could imagine sitting at the bar with Tom Mattern and Tim Taylor and, and say, hey, you want to go to that restaurant? Well, let me Yelp review it first. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a totally different world. But when they come to your website, they should get this experience. They should get your karma. You should be sitting on the couch saying, hey, let me tell you five reasons you should come see me. Uh, you're not going to find anyone better looking. That's obvious. Uh, you're going to find uh, no one closer. I mean, I'm in Memphis. How close could you get? You live in Memphis. And we're going to, you know, just make it fun. Make him laugh. Make him giggle. Make him say, in, in sure. 60 seconds, establish likability and trust. Because all they want to do, they just don't want to get sold a transmission fluid change they don't need. They don't want to buy a new air conditioner they don't need. They just want you to fix it up. And if they like you and they trust you, so go to video on that. 
So, and, and, and then measure it. What is your bounce rate? I mean, there are dental websites that 100 people will land on and not one person calls. And then he says, well, what do you recommend for marketing? Well, why don't you get your bounce rate from 10 people land on your website to one calls? Why don't you maybe get it five people lands on your website in one calls? And then when they call, do you measure that? No. Well, most dental offices, three to four people have to call before your untrained receptionist who you... You name her entire career <laughs> after a piece of furniture. You're the front desk. And uh, <laughs> you're a piece of furniture. In every other business, they're incoming telemarketing. So then you measure, well, how many calls? Okay, so Valerie, you got 100 phone calls and only scheduled 35 appointments. I mean, I, I, I think out of 100 phone calls you could have. Then I ask you, well, well why, were, why were the commercial rate? Well, half of them went to voicemail. And I asked you, well, how many of your calls went to voicemail? No idea. Well, how many that went to voicemail did anyone even listen to? No idea. Well, what are you doing this weekend? I'm flying to the Panky Institute to learn how to adjust canine guided occlusion. Really? Yep. That's your biggest problem? Uh, it, Ten people on your website before one calls, four people call before you get one ass in the chair, and then, and then three people are told they have a cavity and only one gets it done. So to do that one cavity, I need three people in the chair. To get three people in the chair, I needed, I needed nine people to call. To get nine people to call, I needed 90 to land on my website. And your best idea is that you need to get some alphabet soup title behind your last DDS name? Yeah, so true. That'd be, yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, so then so your hygienist sees eight people. She wants a raise because the earth went around the sun one time. It's all based on, uh, I guess, Magellan or Pinocchio or uh, whoever. And, <laughs> and she sees eight Pinocchio. people. She sees eight people, but she only schedules for a recall. So she just lost 25% of your business in one day and wants a raise. For her well, portion, yeah. Yeah, so w w what's, her, what's her reappointment way? She doesn't want to schedule the appointment because she knows she sucks. So she's going to hand you the chart to the lady named after furniture and say, hey, front desk lady, you schedule for a recall. And then the front desk lady says to you, well, do you want to schedule a six-month recall? I'll call you. And that's why oh, when the average <laughs> dentist gets 5,000, up to 5,000 charts, 4,000 of them don't come back. No hygienist, I'm paying you 40 bucks an hour. You schedule your damn recall because incoming sales, I don't know when the phone's going to ring. And when that phone rings, incoming telemarketing needs to take that call and try to convert them to an appointment. You schedule your recall. And furthermore, you're the one getting $40 an hour. So I want to see what your close rate is on getting them reappointed. How come I got two hygienists and one can reappoint 95% of her clients to come back in three, four, six months, but half a year's never want to come back? Maybe you're a bitch. Maybe you talk down to people. Maybe you just talk about yourself. Why don't you go get your hair done? Listen, go find, you should only get your hair done by a cosmetologist that you can't get into that will tell you, yeah, I've had these hundred ladies for 10 years. Okay, I want to see some of that. I want to smell that. They're not talking about their husband and his dirty laundry and their babies. They're talking about you and your family and your babies. All, they're on stage, man. They, I mean, when you go get your uh, Manny Petty done, I mean, I mean, they always say, do you want the sea salt rubbed in? I mean, wh wh where did this come from? What, what homo sapien decided they, they need sea salt rubbed into their calves? But it's, it's that <laughs> whole experience of, I like you because you're talking about me. You're not just trimming my nails. You're rubbing sea salt in my calf. And I, I get a vent to somebody about how horrible my husband is and my children and my neighbors. And the life is so, so horrible, you know, whatever. But you need staff like that. You need so staff like they're doing the mani-pedi, like they're cutting your hair. That's the staff well, you need. Ultimately, basically, this all boils down to what you're, you know, become be a likable person who can communicate well you and your whole team and staff and the 99 percent of the problems we're worrying about are going to slowly fix themselves because we're not you know we're focusing on the wrong things and, and, you, and you'll hire your front desk you'll say well i'm going to hire Susie q because she has 10 years experience and i'm like okay well let's talk about our last practice what would that look like uh, i don't know well did you talk to the nurse uh no he actually yeah, what's killed your himself. Experience? Uh, after he committed suicide uh, she decided to come work for me so I figure I'm about 10 years from hanging myself with rope. And it's like, it's like I don't even want experienced staff that came from a horrible experience in office. I'd rather take the hottest Manny Petty chick who has mm -hmm. 500 women been following her for 10 years and no one will. And the, I'd, rather, I'd rather get her and teach her uh, the computer and dentistry. I'd rather get the uh, best gosh darn 
uh, the girl that no one can get into to get their hair done, because those are the ones who have the, the, and I don't like calling it the new patient experience because it's got to be every patient experience every, patient's every experience. day. Right. I love it. Holy cow. This has been a great episode. I know. Well, these are just, I mean, they're, they're just, basically, this is exactly what I wanted because we've gotten, you know, nugget, 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 nugget that we need to be, we, love we will take, we do love nuggets. Check it, uh, nuggets. And, and implement. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> that, if we will take so we'll an implement. Call, we'll call this in, in, in episode Chicken McNuggets. Nuggets. Chicken the Chicken McNuggets with Howard Ferran. I like that. That's a good one. <laughs> but this yeah, is... yeah. You're so you're you're fifty one percent dentist and you're forty nine percent people person. It's bottom line, and you don't yeah. need more dental technology expensive overhead shit. You need to learn how to attract and retain the best employees. And the lady up front is the most important person in the office because she's taking inbound calls. The only person that's more important than the receptionist is your damn website. And nobody tracks the conversion rate to that. And when they call that office for the first time, that better be your best likable, trusting employee you've got. And, uh, you know, and then, and then when they come, what are you going to do? Someone's going to take her back for x-rays? Well, that dental assistant, she better be rocking hot like the Manny Petty lady. <laughs> she, she needs to be the best cosmetologist in town. And who shows up last? The dentist. Least important. It's like if you own an Least NFL important. team, you want a quarterback. I want the website to crush it. I want inbound receiving telemarketing to be the best live monkey on your team. Your dental assistant to be the next. And by the time you walk in, you could be a cyclops with one eye. And your team would say, hey, he's only got one eye, but damn, can he see he's awesome. that eye? <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. That's right, fantastic. Guys. I'm going to make you proud. I'm going to. I'm going back. I'm going to make the video. Um, I'm going to get our team and make a video on our front page that get, that's basically like five reasons you should come to us or three reasons you come to us in 60 seconds. I'm doing that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah I'm going to send you get, links. Get likable and trust in video because like – if I just saw two still pictures of you, I would I I, I wouldn't feel Probably anything. Like douchebag one and douchebag two. <laughs> but when I but when I see you, I feel something. You know why do people like scary movies? Because they want to feel something. Why do people like roller coasters? They want to scare. They want to feel something. That's what a human. That's what life is. Life is. I want to feel something. And when I look at your photo, am I feeling anything? And wouldn't I feel more if it was a video? Not you know, and, yeah. and this stuff is so obvious, but humans move slow. I mean, for 40 years, they had silent movies and record players. It took 40 years before one monkey thought, should we add those two together? And that was an explosion. Then the third monkey came and said, hey, I'll add popcorn. Now they can eat, see, smell, hear, and the movie industry has never farted since. I mean, make, you know, make them land on your website and feel something. Scare them. Make them laugh. Make <laughs> them feel something, and you'll convert them to come in. And whoever picks up that call is 10 times more important than you, so you treat her with respect, you be humble, you respect her, you be nice. I mean, who would want to piss off the lady on incoming calls? You go to any call center, and they got people, you know, um, they like every time you make a call, they'll give you a scratch lotto ticket. Um, you know, they're, they, they're feeding you. They got measurements they they have contests of who's who's converted the most calls i mean when's the last time you went to your front desk say i'll tell you what um we measure our calls um we get 20 inbound calls a day every damn incoming call that you schedule where i'm gonna go i'm gonna walk across the street myself my own fat ass and buy you a lotto ticket i hope i hope you get 10 people <laughs> in today and win a million dollars by five i mean just, just just the fact that you're even focusing on it you'll crush it and i smell that you guys are both gonna crush it we hope so. We hope so. We appreciate it. Well, All thank right. you so much thank for coming so on the podcast. We're excited. All right. Appreciate Have a great day, guys.